thank you, Gil, for this uh, somewhat hyperbolic introduction. I hope he hasn't uh, r raised your expect expectations uh, too high. Uh, but I will uh, make an effort to uh, actually uh, fulfill the, the, the program that is set out in the title uh, of this lecture. But before I start, uh, let, me, um, uh, uh, let me underline the fact that I'm really very, very happy and very honored to be here. Uh, ever since I started studying Assyriology, uh, this institute, the Oriental Institute, has, um, in my mind, been sort of the, 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 the center, uh, or not one of the center, in fact, the center of, 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 of the discipline that I uh, had chosen for my professional career. My teachers in various uh, phases of their, uh, of their own career have been here for uh, one or two years or another one um, came back regularly to work on the Assyrian Dictionary. So stories about the Oriental Institute were always told to us uh, during classes and in a way I, I, I have always identified um, my discipline very much with this place. So every, 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 every time I'm here uh, it is something special uh, for me and uh, having been given the honor to address you here at this occasion is uh, even more um, relevant and, 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 and moving for me. So I'm really, really grateful for all of you who made it possible for me to be here today. And <clears throat> I just hope that what I will tell you today will, uh, to some degree, um, repay the effort you have made for getting me here. So. Um, what I'm going to talk about uh, are, um, is an issue that we are all familiar with. Uh, I'm talking about economic growth. Uh, the question uh, uh, what prompts economic growth uh, and uh, how it can be sustained, uh, um, how it can be lost as an economic uh, trend. Uh, the question whether uh, it is the product of contingent economic forces or whether state agency has a decisive role to play. Um, these are questions we are all familiar with. Uh, I will uh, try to um, set out an, a, a case study taken from antiquity um, where we can see some mechanisms uh, in effect that we actually can uh, recognize. Nevertheless, obviously, we are talking about an ancient economy and there are uh, very significant uh, differences to our own economic world, which I will underline when we come to these points. Uh, on the right-hand side of this slide, you see uh, some uh, um, uh, Anglo-Saxon uh, economists and, uh, whose work has been relevant for the theoretical framework of this uh, paper, Malthus uh, for demography, uh, John Minot Keynes for the basic mechanism I see uh, at work in the Babylonian economy, and uh, Douglas North for new institutional economics, uh, which gives a very powerful um, theoretical framework for conceptualizing uh, the phenomena we find in our data. And now I come to my data. I'm going to speak about Babylonia, so uh, what is today southern Iraq, in the, essentially in the 6th century um, BCE, so in the period of the Neo-Babylonian Empire, which at its largest extension covered the area you see set out on this map in well, green. Um, this uh, Babylonian Empire uh, uh, came into being in the late 7th century, stepping in the footsteps of the Neo-Assyrian Empire. It was in its turn conquered by uh, the, um, the, the rising uh, Persian um, well, then Empire in 539 BC. Uh, so part of my period is actually the Persian period. Um, you will see to which degree the Persian conquest, conquest is relevant for the um, uh, analysis of the economy of this period. Uh, I will not say very much about the nature of the sources. Uh, I would just uh, point out that we are dealing here with one of the best documented periods uh, in all of antiquity. Uh, this sixth century uh, has left us um, tens of thousands of cuneiform documents, <clears throat> uh, administrative documents, legal texts of uh, various kinds, of which maybe 
25,000 have been read, have been studied, and it is this uh, body of material that is at the basis of uh, what I'm going to tell you today. Um, to introduce you to uh, what I'm trying to do here, um, let me uh, um, familiarize you with the concept of wheat wages. Uh, the advantage of the Neo-Babylonian documentation from the 6th century is that it, it allows us to make uh, uh, arguments based on quantification. Uh, as you all know, uh, economics, economists uh, have a great interest in numbers and uh, unfortunately for antiquity uh, we have uh, not that much uh, data uh, that allows quantification. The Neo-Babylonian uh, period is an exception in that we actually can uh, uh, draw on these thousands of texts to build some rudimentary statistics. It's not a very elaborate statistical argument that I'm going to make, but numbers are at the heart of what I'm going to tell you about. Um, weed wages. Uh, this is uh, a concept uh, developed by economic historians to, uh, to um, make a comparison of, of levels of prosperity, of living standards possible over long periods of time. Essentially, wheat wages are conceptualized as the quantity of wheat in liters that uh, the uh, average wage of a manual laborer can purchase. In, so in one uh, day, you earn so and so much money in whichever uh, denomination uh, that will buy you a certain quantity of wheat. And this quantity of wheat can be compared over periods. Uh, wheat is not, nothing else than a stand-in for food, for calories. We could also say so and so many calories. Um, uh, and you can see how, uh, how comparing the quantity of food uh, an average wage uh, will buy can be useful for uh, analy analyzing living standards in a pre-modern society where obviously um, a large part of the population is very close to subsistence levels and is mostly interested in having enough to eat every day. Um, here you have some numbers from the early modern period. Uh, you see um, numbers, uh, if we take just Vienna uh, as, as, as uh, an example, uh, which range from 18 liters down to 8 liters and to 5.7 liters. It's uh, interesting to see that uh, the later we get in this sample, the lower the wages are. Uh, and I will just remind you, uh, if you look at uh, 1775 and this uh, wages of 5.7 liters, um, I will just remind you of the fact that the French Revolution, which started a few years after this, was to some degree a revolution, a revolution carried by, um, by, by uh, masses that were um, suffering uh, from famine, essentially. Uh, so remember this range from uh, 5 to 20 liters. We will now, oh yes, and I should point out uh, for the, the, the data from America, 15.9 liters in Maryland. Uh, and just to show you that we are living in a completely different economic world, um, for Austria I have calculated the wheat wage for 2003, uh, 369 liters, uh, for 2011, 277 liters. You see that the wheat wage in Austria has dropped uh, by uh, significantly in, uh, in those two, uh, in, in those uh, eight years. Uh, this is the financial crisis that has uh, hit uh, incomes, obviously. The, the same kind of calculation could be done also for America. So now we move to antiquity. And you see here uh, the wheat wages taken from different types of data for different phases of antiquity and different regions. Um, this is, I'm, I'm basing myself here on work uh, done by Walter Scheidel uh, from Stanford for the later periods and the Mesopotamian data are mine. Um, you see that uh, for um, the most part, uh, wheat wages range around five to seven liters. Yeah. This is fairly standard and uh, it doesn't really matter whether you're in, in, in Imperial Rome or in Sumer, in, the, in Mesopotamia in, at the end of the uh, third millennium, this is more or less what you get. Uh, however, there are a few phases uh, in recorded history where these wheat wages, so the average wage a laborer will get, are significantly higher. 
And um, one of these phases uh, is the period I'm talking about, where we get uh, essentially wheat wages that are double of what we would expect in the long run. And another such phase is Athens in the fourth uh, century. So just to give you a comparison. And uh, my question here is, how come that in this period uh, I'm talking about, we have so high wages, uh, wages that can be taken to uh, be proxy data for overall a comparatively high living standard. So where does this prosperity come from? Uh, the structure of this talk is set out in this slide. I will give you um, a brief introduction to the Babylonian economy. I will speak um, about agriculture, labor, and money. Uh, then I will uh, speak about the role of the state in shaping the economy. Um, I can uh, tell you already now that, uh, in my view, the role of the state is crucial in creating this uh, prosperous uh, phase. Um, <coughs> And finally, I will address the question of prosperity and inequality. This is another uh, issue that is being uh, discussed also in our times. It's, it's a very important issue, I believe. And I want to show you here that uh, we can also use ancient data to address such questions that uh, interest us today in our own political lives. Here on this slide, you set out, uh, you see, you find set out the basic features of the Babylonian economy in the sixth century. This is uh, a phase of Babylonian history in which uh, the country um, experienced, experienced uh, rapid demographic growth and at the same time increasing urbanization. So not only were more people living in the country, uh, more people were living in cities or in large settlements. Um, the agrarian base of the economy, we are obviously talking about the pre-modern economy, so the majority of the population is working in agriculture. The agrarian base of the economy is expanding, um, not only quantitatively, but also qualitatively. So uh, agriculture becomes more intensive. We find uh, specialization of cultivation and uh, cash crop production, so production of, uh, of, of staples, uh, specifically for the market. Um, uh, at the same time, we find an increase, increasing use of silver money. This is not coined, uh, but it still uh, fulfills all uh, the, the money functions uh, we typically associate with uh, genuine all-purpose money. Uh, so we find an increasing monetization of exchange. Uh, we find uh, a degree of labor specialization. Uh, so uh, the secondary sector of the economy becomes increasingly more complex. Uh, the secondary sector is largely situated in cities, as one would expect. Um, we find a large importance uh, of, of free wage labor, which is also something uh, economic historians would not necessarily expect in Mesopotamia, all of which um, shows us that we are dealing with what I would call an Iron Age economy that in many aspects is structurally fundamentally different from the preceding uh, economies of the Mesopotamian Bronze Age. The um, agrarian basis uh, for these developments um, uh, is uh, to be found in the fact that the Babylonian agrarian economy is one of the rare cases of a two-crop um, uh, agrarian economy. So they have two leading crops, they have dates and barley. Um, that have nearly equal importance uh, for, uh, for nutrition and the overall economy. This is, uh, as in, in, in early modern uh, uh, Ireland, where in addition to grain, uh, uh, the potato was, started, uh, was, was, was cultivated and brought a completely uh, different type of agrarian uh, system into being. What is the point here. So I apologize for the fact that you have some uh, statistics or figures set out here, but it, it's very simple. 
Um, we know from, uh, from uh, anthropological data taken from Iraqi farmers in the 1940s and 1950s uh, that in trad traditional nutrition in Iraq, um, essentially staples, uh, so uh, cereals and dates can be used interchangeably. Together they make up uh, two-thirds to three-quarters of uh, the food uh, an Iraqi farmer will eat during uh, a normal year. Um, the, 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 the point is important that the one can be substituted for the other. Uh, it, it may not be necessarily very healthy to eat uh, large quantities of dates all the time. It will do things to your teeth, but nevertheless you can survive. Um, for uh, economic history, the important thing to know is... Oops. Does this laser pointer work? No. Uh, the important thing uh, is, maybe I need to switch it on. Yeah. Do you see this red dot? The important thing uh, to know is set out here. Arable farming um, is significantly less productive than date gardening. One man day of labor in arable farming will produce up to 55,000 calories of food. Uh, one man day of labor for date gardening uh, can produce up to double this amount. So if you manage to organize your economy in such a way that you get significant numbers of farmers to switch from arable farming to date farming, you will essentially double the output of your, uh, of, of your agricultural sector and thus in a pre-modern society you will nearly double the output of your entire economy. So this is very, very relevant. And we see exactly that happening in our period. Uh, I give you just one example. Here you see set out uh, the estates of a temple situated in this city. All these little dots are estates. Um, uh, we will see how uh, these estates develop over time. Here we are at the, more or less at the beginning of our, our period. We see uh, not all of these estates are active, so they, they, they are starting to build this canal, at the, uh, to dig this canal at this time, so all these estates that are later active do not exist at, in 600 BCE. You see a couple of red dots, uh, grain farming, and few green dots, a uh, few uh, date farming estates. Now we move on 50 years. Remember they are digging this canal here. And lo and behold, um, 50 years later, we find these grain farming estates here. Obviously, if you start uh, uh, working on an estate, you will first begin with grain farming because date palms need some time to grow. So in the first phase, uh, you will have uh, just uh, arable farming. But another 50 years later, all these estates here that were grain farming are now essentially uh, specializing in date cultivation. And for this temple, we know that in this roughly one century, uh, they, uh, they, they, the temple doubled, or actually more than doubled, its agrarian output. So this is very, very significant. Um, because what we see here is a process that happened all over the place in Babylonia in this period. It's a period of peace you can invest, and thus the agrarian output uh, increases. And this output, uh, uh, generates a huge surplus above subsistence needs and this surplus is sold on the market. Yeah? So th this is the basic uh, mechanism that produces economic growth in Babylonia from within. Another aspect. This is uh, southern Mesopotamia, so uh, Babylonia. Uh, all these green dots are cities where the Neo-Babylonian kings undertook major building work, essentially all over the country, everywhere. Yeah. They, built, they dug canals, they built walls, and in the cities they built temples and palaces. If we go to Babylon, we see the entire cityscape is being transformed in this period. They are building everywhere, especially in the capital. And they are building huge things. This is Nebuchadnezzar's palace. Yeah? Um, the South Palace, the North Palace, not entirely excavated. 
Uh, just to give you an, a comparison, um, uh, for those of you who have been in Vienna, this is the Imperial Palace in Schönbrunn, same scale. Yeah? Um, uh, Schönbrunn is not small, for those of you who have been there. It, it's, uh, uh, it's more or less the size of Versailles. Yeah? So this is uh, a significant building, but uh, the Nebuchadnezzar's palace is much, much larger. Yeah, it is, of course, a different type of palace institution, etc. Um, I'm just giving you this comparison uh, to, 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 to let you understand the scale of uh, what, uh, what they're building in this period. And the, qu the question is, of course, um, who actually built all this? Who paid for it? And economically speaking, what were the consequences of these massive building projects? which clearly involved a large part of the population, a large part of the economy. When uh, talking, when, when addressing this issue, uh, we are now moving to these parts of the uh, diagnostic features of the Babylonian economy. So we have to talk about monetization and about labor. Or rather, first I will talk about labor and afterwards I will talk about money. And you will see why um, money and labor are uh, important for understanding uh, the question, I, or for answering the question I um, set out before showing you the, these, these building projects. What are the sources of labor we have uh, in this period? Um, obviously, you can have forced labor. You can have serfs, you can have slaves, you can have uh, deportees. Um, the fact of the matter is that maybe contrary to what one would expect, uh, forced labor is always scarce in this period. Um, you don't have huge quantities, huge numbers of slaves that you can use for large-scale building work. And uh, we have many, many explicit statements of this in the letters of the administrators, uh, as, as in this case where one administrator writes to another uh, saying that um, of his workload load of uh, 4,000 cubits to be dug, so uh, a stretch of canal, only a quarter was done by conscripted labor. The rest, so three quarters, uh, was uh, in the hands of people who worked for money-free laborers. Um, so serfs, then we get um, temporary workers, conscripted men, who are called up for temporary labor service as a part of a duty, uh, a labor duty owed to the state. Um, these these uh, people are numerous. Uh, however, even here, uh, free labor has a role to play because normally uh, people who are called up for service, if uh, they can at all, they will hire someone else to do the labor. So they, if, 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 if you can, you will, will pay someone else to go and dig the canal. Um, and then again, free labor comes into it. Yeah. And all of this labor, um, this free hired labor, is being paid with silver. So the, you see here how monetization and uh, labor is uh, tied together. <clears throat> Sometimes it's doubted in the literature that there is such a thing as a labor market in Babylonia. In the 6th century, there certainly is. Uh, I'm just citing here, here another letter which gives a nice example. Um, a weaver is writing to his superior, let my lord give me money to hire laborers. Men who are for hire are laying siege to my doorstep, so please do not let my work stand still for lack of funds to hire them. Yeah. So, <clears throat> Labor is available, you just need to have the money uh, to pay these people. Now, uh, how can we um, quantify the importance of the three types of labor? Free hired labor, slave <coughs> or serfs labor, <coughs> excuse me, or um, corvée labor? <coughs> Again, we have one very informative dossier. Uh, this dossier concerns the canal I have already talked about, the canal uh, along which we, we earlier saw these estates. Um, 
the documentation for this canal comes from the temple of Ibabar in this city. Uh, the, this, this temple is responsible for the digging of the canal, but it's drawing on all sorts of resources for uh, doing so. Uh, the canal is intended to, to, to link the two uh, main rivers, the Euphrates and the Tigris. Um, towards the end of the 6th century, they actually con uh, completed this canal and it was in existence until the Sasanian period. Um, it appears in the Talmud quite frequently, as uh, always as the, uh, in, uh, um, with, with, with its name, the King's Canal. From the archives of this temple here, of the Ebaber Temple in Sippar, we find a dossier of, work, uh, of, of lists of workers, of rosters of workers, um, which look like this. So we get a heading, temple personnel, covey workers and hirelings working on the dam at Gilusho. So this is this construction they're doing. Then you get an itemized list of, all, of, 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 of people of different status and different origin. Um, and a, a, a summary. If one, uh, usually these texts are broken or they are damaged, but still you, you, you can uh, work with, with, with the numbers you find in these texts. And if you quantify uh, the uh, entire documentation that is available, you can come up with uh, this uh, very rough statistic. Uh, these are man days of labor that are documented in this, uh, in this uh, series of, of workers lists. And we see that um, hired laborers um, are, account, uh, are um, responsible for Two thirds of the total of labor documented in these lists, the other uh, categories of uh, workers, so conscripted uh, um, uh, forced labor and serfs, uh, they make up uh, just one third. So, two thirds of the labor on this project is done by hired labor, and this is probably typical rather than exceptional on, uh, in, in, uh, when compare, uh, this, this, this can be shown when comparing the documentation for other large-scale building projects. So, public building, and we have seen that there's really lots of public building going on, uh, depends on hired laborers who were paid money wages. Um, the organization of this was quite often in the hand of private entrepreneurs, people who um, obviously profit from what they're doing in this uh, area of the economy. Um, this means that these uh, public building projects channel huge amounts of money into the economy, which then circulates within the economy. Um, and at the same time, a very significant number of, uh, of men is employed throughout the year or through large parts of the year over a seri series of years, even decades, uh, in these uh, building projects, we have some evidence that points uh, towards um, people working sort of full time throughout their entire working life on such, such projects. So we get really a kind of working class to some degree uh, uh, as a result of, of, of these large scale uh, labor um, uh, project. So we've, we've been talking about uh, wages, so we also have to talk about prices. Uh, we've seen how huge amounts of money get into circulation. Uh, we, I mentioned these agrarian surpluses that are sold on the market. Um, how do these markets uh, work? What do they tell us about uh, the economy uh, as, as, as such? Uh, we have, uh, for the first time in Mesopotamian, or actually in recorded history, um, sufficiently rich data that uh, allow um, the, 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 the plotting of price developments over a significant uh, number of years. Uh, we can make a sustained uh, statistical argument about the nature of these prices. Um, they are um, clearly um, exhibiting what economists call a random walk. Uh, that means uh, they are unpredictable. Yeah? And the random walk, this is a statistical feature you can, uh, you can um, demonstrate using mathematical models, not terribly complicated models. This random walk is characteristic of prices that are set by uh, supply and demand, which is what we expect, of course, but which has not always been 
accepted for uh, the Mesopotamian economy. So here we can sort of mathematically prove the existence of a supply and demand mechanism. Um, uh, this is a co corollary of what I've just said. There is a strong interrelation between uh, prices for different commodities. Um, this price development, and I will show you this in a second, allows us um, to identify several characteristic macroeconomic trends in the Babylonian economy uh, that can be linked to other features of, of this economic system that we know about from non-quantifiable data. Here on this graph, um, I have plotted together several price series. Um, the, 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 what I did was uh, artificially s uh, setting the price in the year 500, uh, minus 560, so 559 BC. Um, I've set these prices at 100. This, this is just an index. Okay? Um, and you see then for the different commodities how prices develop from this common point uh, onwards. So you see that they're falling uh, generally in the beginning of the century and then they are rising slowly and then they are rising ever more steeply uh, until we get uh, to the first uh, decade of the fifth century uh, when prices are falling again. And you see that, for instance, the grain price, which is this blue line here, um, uh, uh, rises uh, up to sixfold uh, within sort of 50 years. Yeah? Whereas other, other prices uh, rise only fourfold or threefold or uh, double. Yeah? So you see, you see there is a significant uh, change here, but, uh, or the difference between various commo different commodities that can be, uh, need to be discussed and can be explained in part. But you also see that the overall price trend is very consistent uh, for all these commodities. The first uh, phase of, the, um, of uh, our century um, is marked by falling prices. Uh, falling prices because of increased supply. From the 550s onward, we see the effect of these large quantities of money that are being pumped into the economy. We increasingly, increasingly get uh, inflation and a uh, resultant uh, price rise. Uh, however, this is not the only sort of uh, factor that accounts for uh, this very steep price rise later in the century. Um, in, we know from uh, uh, anecdotal uh, information that uh, in the 540s and the 530s, there was a sequence of bad harvests, um, so supply shocks that drove up prices even more. So in, in addition to inflation, we get also a scarcity and thus even higher prices. And then we have the Persian conquest, 539 and increasing uh, Persian taxation and a Persian interest in withdrawing um, uh, staples from Babylonia, channeling uh, these, uh, these staples mostly into Iran. And this is then a demand shock, as uh, economists would call it. So there's a, increasing, a significantly increase in demand, and this drives, price, this drives prices up even more. So especially the grain price uh, here um, is reaching uh, levels which have to be considered uh, the levels of severe crisis towards the end of uh, the, uh, the, the sixth century. So here in this uh, in, in this phase of our period, we can't talk about uh, prosperity anymore. Um, the really prosperous phase of the 6th century is from, say, 570 or 575 to maximum 545. So this is the, the, the benign phase. Afterwards, things get really problematic. Uh, finally, at the end of the, of, of the period I'm interested in here, we see again falling prices. Um, to some degree because of deflation, I believe. Deflation because these large-scale building projects have stopped. Now, the, 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 the Persian 
uh, kings don't invest so much anymore in the Babylonian economy, they build elsewhere, and hence we have, uh, relative, relatively speaking, a uh, decrease uh, in money that is uh, in circulation. Now, if one draws together the several threads of uh, what I have been telling you here and adds some other um, features I, for reasons of time, can't discuss here in detail, it is possible to connect all of this by means of uh, what I would call a commercialization model, uh, which draws, uh, obviously, uh, in part quite strongly on, on uh, aspects of, econo of, of economics which would have been very familiar to John Maynard Keynes. Uh, we begin with population growth, which is seen not just as a Malthusian challenge, but rather as a stimulus for development. Uh, we have a rising demand, obviously, because we have more people, but at the same time we have also an input of resources, these are the royal investments I talked about, which together generate positive in feedback in the economy. We have, and we can, uh, I, I could not discuss this in detail, we have this evidence for division of labor and specialization uh, and a very highly developed uh, entrepreneurial culture, all of which contributes to higher productivity, certainly in the agrarian uh, sector, this is very clearly documented, uh, higher productivity that leads to economic growth. Economic growth that to a large degree is situated in the cities, uh, which are a center of uh, high consumption, but also of uh, production, and uh, uh, which shape the, 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 the agrarian hinterland uh, through, uh, through uh, their consumption patterns, but also through uh, their contribution to uh, production. For all of this, uh, this is a model that can be applied to other phases of, uh, of, of, of economic history in other, uh, in other parts of, 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 of the world, obviously. For instance, for the later Middle Ages, uh, much uh, this, the same kind of argument could be made. Um, now, I refer to uh, the paradigm of uh, new institutional economics here. Um, when talking about the agency of the state in all of this, uh, my argument is that all of this would not have happened hadn't it been for significant involvement of the state of the crown. Um, obviously, uh, political stability, which is new in the sixth century, uh, is the precondition for this eco economic development. You can't, you can't uh, grow dates if uh, every second year the Assyrians come and will cut down your date palms. So if you have peace, then you can do this kind of thing. If you don't have peace, then it's impossible. Um, so stability, obviously something the state delivers. Um, the state invested heavily in, in uh, the agrarian infrastructure, which leads to extensive and intensive growth. Um, on the interface between the institutional and the private sector, uh, especially in these building, uh, in the context of these building projects, uh, we have a perfect setting for entrepreneurial uh, activities, and we see that private um, fortunes are made in this sector. Um, and we have seen these royal investments in uh, in, in these, these these buildings, in these uh, building sites in the cities, which. Uh, pump enormous quantities of silver into the economy and thus contribute significantly to this economic boom. At the same time, uh, this is one of the causes of the severe inflation we see later. So the state is crucial for all of what we have seen. And uh, the, what Patricia, uh, Patricia Krone has called the capstone model for the pre-modern state, so a capstone that holds all things in place, but uh, precludes change and development. This capstone model is clearly inappropriate for the role of the Babylonian uh, state in this period. Now, if you have followed what I've said, you have perhaps noticed that there is um, an elephant in the room. Is there something I haven't talked about? And this is the obvious question, where do the funds come from that the state invests that are so crucial for this development? Do we have resource, but well, the state has to get this stuff somewhere. Huh? Uh, so do we, do we have 
in, in mostly a, a model that is based on resource extraction in the imperial center. So do we have a tax and spend model? Or do these resources come from the imperial periphery? So do we have, as an alternative to tax and spend, a plunder, pillage, burn, and spend model? Yeah. Let's look to the imperial center. We know a lot about taxation in this period. Uh, we know that the state is mostly interested in labor and in military service, not so much in commodities or, 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 or um, uh, taxes paid in cash. There are some, but it's not crucial. We know that the, tax, that the state targeted those sectors of the economy that had, the, that had some surplus uh, to, to at, at their disposal and that were easily reachable. So property urban uh, households and temples. Um, the idea was to invest minimum bureaucratic effort for maximum effect. This is, this is the, the, the idea behind the Babylonian tax model. Uh, for the bulk of the population, especially as the rural population, I don't believe that the power of the state very frequently reached down to the level of individual households. The reach of the state, even though it was a fairly efficient state for the standards of the time, the reach of the state was limited. Um, and society is large, at large was uh, targeted in terms of taxation, uh, if at all, mostly through indirect uh, taxes, taxes on transactions, taxes on transport, such things. But direct taxation was not a major concern for the population at large, which means that the majority of uh, a large part of, of the funds that are invested by the Babylonian uh, crown in, the, in, in Babylonia must have come from elsewhere. So they mu must have come from the imperial periphery. And here I apologize uh, to the Assyrians uh, who have done much the same thing, but in contrast, the Babylonians have left us the pictorial representation of what they did in the provinces or what they did to those who objected to their view of how, how um, politics should be run. Uh, the best evidence uh, for the, uh, the, the effects of Babylonian imperial rule um, can be found in Judah, so in the uh, westernmost periphery of the empire, where large-scale uh, surveys, archaeological surveys, have uh, allowed us to um, recognize the presence of a massive reduction in population levels in the period of Babylonian occupation. And if we see figures like this, uh, this is taken from a book by Odette Lipschitz. Um, end of the Iron Age, one estimated population in, uh, in, in, um, in Judah, 108,000. After the Babylonians have left, 30,000. Um, this must be linked to the agency of the Babylonian state. And this, I argue, is sort of the other side of the coin. This, this is the, the, the other side of the prosperity in the imperial center. <coughs> so this is what imperial rule in uh, Iron Age Mesopotamia is also about. Now, if I have still 10 minutes, is this possible? I come to my final point, which is inequality. Um, here I take my cue from a book that has been discussed a lot in recent years, uh, Thomas Piketty, French economist, um, at the capital in the 21st uh, century. His argument is that uh, economic growth, I'm simplifying, but this is what it, comes down, uh, what it boils down to, economic growth is necessarily accompanied by growing inequality unless there are checks and balances that are put into the system by politics. Uh, uh, historically speaking, the most effective level of inequality is war, is violence. Otherwise, uh, if economies are left to their own devices, this is Piketty's argument, uh, and if economies grow, then inequality will grow um, in step. So my question is, can, can we do a kind of Pikettian argument for Babylonia? Maybe. I'm comparing the, the Babylonian Iron Age 
with uh, a period 1,000 years earlier with the Mesopotamian Bronze Age, the Middle Bronze Age. Um, we can, for instance, do a very simple thing. Um, we can uh, compare dowry lists. Uh, so the documents look very much the same, uh, even though they're 1,000 years uh, in between. Uh, but if you actually look at the stuff that is given with the brides uh, to, to, uh, to be taken into the new household, you see that the dowry lists in the neighbor Babylonian period are incomparably richer. They simply have more stuff. Uh, and since these texts come from the same uh, sector of the economy, uh, sorry, of, the, of, of society, these, are pro these come from property urban households in both periods, uh, we can argue that these neo Babylonian people are clearly richer than their old Babylonian predecessors, even though they have the same social niche in the society. And this, of course, ties in neatly with what I've shown you with these wheat wages. Um, wheat wages in uh, the sixth century are close to double, not quite double, of what they are in the Middle Bronze Age in Mesopotamia. So those two data sets uh, neatly corrobor corroborate each other. So we can consider it a given, uh, or we consider it proved that the neighbor Babylonian uh, society, at least the urban society, uh, was richer than uh, the Middle Bronze Age uh, Old Babylonian society. Uh, what can we say about inequality? Um, we can consider the given that elites are always, so the top of the society, the small uh, upper, uh, uppermost stratum, these people are always very, very rich. And then we must reckon with uh, an existence at subsistence level uh, for the bulk of the population. But we can make a more nuanced argument for these property urban classes, which are sort of, excuse me, the generalization, upper middle class or some such thing. Yeah? Um, what I propose to do, um, I'm not going to the, into the technicalities, but uh, briefly, I compare in terms of daily income in wheat over a year, one can figure out uh, uh, this, this income, uh, I compare inheritance shares given to males in the old Babylonian period, uh, I compare these data to dowries from the neo Babylonian period. Why don't I compare, say, inheritance shares of males from the old Babylon, Babylonian period with inheritance shares from the neighbor Babylonian period would like to, but we just don't have sufficient data. So I have to compare dowries, so essentially inheritance shares given to women uh, in the late period uh, with, uh, um, uh, with uh, inheritance shares given to sons in the early period. Uh, clearly, we can assume that there is a correlation, a stable correlation uh, between the size of these dowries, so the, 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 the income you can generate from them, uh, and the overall household wealth from which these dowries or inheritance shares are taken. If one quantifies these data, we see, I'm just, uh, we see we have a significant range here. From, so this is, again, this liters of wheat per day. Yeah? Uh, Near Babylonian, uh, without outliers, one to 78, 79 liters. Uh, old Babylonian, uh, more or less one liter to 22 liters. Yeah? The median uh, is 7.1 in the old Babylonian period, uh, 12 in the neighbor Babylonian period, yeah? higher in the neighbor Babylonian period. Uh, note that these um, figures are pleasingly close to the mean wage. Yeah, which means that there is a correlation here. Uh, obviously, an, an, an inheritance uh, share or a dowry is intended to keep someone alive, so there, it's expected that there will be a correlation between the, uh, the, the, the value of dowry and the, 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 the income of a worker. Um, yeah, and the information here uh, is easier, easier explained by looking at the graph. The blue, I scaled the available old Babylonian data just from the lowest to the highest. And this is this blue line. And the green line is the available neo-Babylonian data. And what you see here is that the old Babylonian data does not scatter very wide, widely. It's quite coherent. Whereas the old Babylonian data scatters much more widely. Uh, the neo-Babylonian data scatters much more widely. 
and this uh, is said here. So 40% are in a central uh, 5 to 12 liter range for Old Babylonian, and only 26% uh, uh, of the neighbor Babylonian diaries are in this central range. So, in other words, we, we see two things here. Um, first, uh, we see a confirmation of, of what we already know, that the, late, that the late Babylonian period, the neo babylonian period, was richer than the old Babylonian period, because synchronically, at the same time, you would expect inheritance shares for males to be more valuable than dowries given to women. Here we see that the Neo-Babylonian dowries are more valuable than the inheritance shares of the old Babylonian men. This is just the opposite of what you would expect in one period. And then, second point, um, we also see that these dowries scatter more widely. And this means that they are more unequal, essentially. Yeah? And since I argue that these dowries are proxy data for the overall household incomes. Uh, this means that neo-Babylonian households have a more unequal division of property than old Babylonian households. So they are richer, and at the same time, they are more unequal, which is a very neat confirmation of the main argument made by Piketty. Of course, it will only take you so far, but um, I still find this a satisfactory result. And now I come to my final point. We have been talking about prosperity and a relatively high uh, standard of living in this period. Um, we should not forget uh, that these quantitative data just show us one aspect of uh, society. Here I show you another aspect. Um, I will just read you uh, this text, uh, which is an interrogation protocol from, taken from a temple archive. This is a statement made by female temple serfs, uh, serfs who work in a flower grinding sort of sweatshop. This is the most unpleasant work you can do in Mesopotamia, grinding flour uh, with a uh, millstone. Um, they make the following statement to, the temp to temple officials. On the 22nd day of the month of Ayaru, the first day of Cambyses, king of Babylon, king of all the lands, uh, Mitsatu, a female serf of Ishtar, of the goddess Ishtar of Uruk, took a lump of clay in our presence and beat, <clears throat> and beat a dog with it. We asked her, why are you beating the dog? And she replied, I would like to die together with it. Itishu lumut. The dog she beat died of the beating. End of text. That's astonishing, perhaps. Uh, what is this about? Um, essentially, I think this woman who is, you must remember, she's a serf, she is doing horrible work. She is probably badly fed. She is miserable. She expresses this misery by venting her feelings on the only, be on, on the only being around that is possibly below her in the pecking order. This, this poor dog. She kills the dog. But at the same time, it is Shulumut, I would like to die with, to, together with it. She identifies with the animal. Um, this, this is typical for Mesopotamia. If you want to insult someone, not only for Mesopotamia, but if you want to assault, insult someone, you, 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 you tell her or him, you're a dog. Yeah? So this is, really, this is a lowly animal. So in the end, she identifies with this animal. She feels like a dog, essentially, and expresses some kind of death wish. Yeah? Because she is horribly miserable. Why do the temple officials take note of this whole thing? Well, because uh, wanting to die, essentially, is subversive. Yeah? You're supposed to live, and you are supposed to work. If you express your wish to die, um, you are disrupting the system, so uh, they will take note of it. And in a nutshell, this text, I believe, shows you again another, gives you another insight into this, uh, into this society, into this economy. I've been speaking about prosperity, about comparatively booming society, still we have to remember this is a society where large numbers were incredibly miserable. I thank you.